with what seems like a constant stream of stories of crooks and abusers and liars just getting away with it, it's nice to revisit the times where they actually don't. And sure, it's perfectly justified to say that the accountability in this case isn't enough, but since I've been conditioned to expect zero in every other context, I will take positive accountability values where they can be found. And no, I'm not even talking about Sam Bankman Freed of FTX fraud fame, or at least unknowing fraud, according to his recurring interview commentary, not under oath. Of course, saying that under penalty of perjury will now be avoided by the timing of his new charges and pending extradition from the Bahamas that abruptly canceled his sworn testimony before members of Congress. I'll believe in accountability in that case when I see it, or maybe when the cameras see it. There are a lot of steps between the beach house and the prison cell, a lot of opportunity for Epstein-style oddities and malfunctions in the meantime. So before we all move on from a prior scandal, there is something of a proper ending to discuss, or at least the prospect of one. Recall the story of the Loudoun County Public School District in Northern Virginia that was the primary flashpoint and something of a trend across the country of conflict between parents and school administrators last year. It's a story that was consequential nationally in that it was a primary piece of evidence that the National School Board Association used in a letter to President Biden that characterized these parent protests as a form of domestic terrorism and hate crimes, a letter to which Attorney General Merrick Garland personally responded without dispute of those allegations, and a pledge to have the FBI look into the matter. And of course, even more importantly, it was locally consequential because a serious crime against a student was covered up in pursuit of the ideology. Remember, the worst of this scandal wasn't about masks. It wasn't about pronouns or critical race theory. It was about the rape of a student in a school bathroom. One of the most animated, terrorist-adjacent parents of the controversy was Scott Smith, who was arrested for disorderly conduct at a June 22, 2021 Loudoun County School Board meeting after things got physical. At the time, we were supposed to believe he was just some enraged right-wing fanatic motivated by his hatred for the science or for trans people or for historic fact, but it turned out he was enraged by exactly the sort of thing that should enrage any father, an attack on his daughter and a subsequent cover-up. Smith attended the meeting because his daughter had been raped in a school bathroom by a male student the month prior on May 28th. Unsatisfied with administrative action, he spoke at the meeting to ask what school officials planned to do about it. And things didn't get rowdy because Smith couldn't ask a question politely, things got rowdy because he wasn't treated politely. According to a newly released grand jury report, another attendee was accosting and bullying Smith's wife, and this woman told the couple that the assault on their daughter did not happen in the way they described. The woman threatened to ruin Smith's business on social media. Smith responded in colorful terms, and the scuffle ensued resulting in Smith's arrest. We have this grand jury report after new governor Glenn Youngkin convened it to investigate this story as one of his first acts as governor in January. And after nearly a year of investigation, we not only have the facts now, but we have charges too. The now former superintendent of the school district, Scott Ziegler, fired upon the publication of this grand jury report, has now been indicted on several charges, but notably for lying about what happened, despite his knowledge of what did. Because of course, this isn't just a case of what happened in a bathroom attack. It's a case of lies and a cover-up to shield ideological goals from any damage. The grand jury report corroborates the reporting of Luke Rosiak at the Daily Wire, who broke the story last year. In May 2021, Smith's daughter had indeed been raped in a bathroom at Stonebridge High School in Ashburn by a skirt and blouse wearing male student with whom his daughter had an existing relationship. The district handled that case by quietly transferring the attacker to another school, where he then sexually assaulted another female student in October. The attacker was convicted for both incidents in January and sentenced to supervised probation at a residential treatment facility. And of course, there are plenty of questions about the process in place that allowed a sexual predator to prey on another student elsewhere only months after getting caught the first time, but 
this latest indictment isn't about policy wisdom. It's about lying about what happened. The entire conflict at the school board meeting in Loudoun County that summer centers around not just the bathroom attack, but the policy that the school board was pushing and indeed soon thereafter passed. Parents were protesting in part a new proposed transgender bathroom policy in which students would be allowed to use bathrooms and locker rooms of their choosing based on gender identity. That policy was adopted later that summer on August 11th. Obviously, concerns about what could happen as a result of a policy that mixes boys and girls in bathroom and locker room settings were motivational for parents at this June school board meeting. But Scott Smith was saying these concerns aren't just theoretical because the worst actually happened to his daughter. But in the context of the push for a new bathroom policy, that inconvenience was not to be believed. And so after Smith was removed from the meeting, the board resumed discussion and the superintendent denied any legitimacy to the claim. At a later point in the meeting, a school board member asked Superintendent Scott Ziegler, quote, do we have assaults in our bathrooms or in our locker rooms regularly? I would hope not, but I'd like clarification. The superintendent responded, quote, To my knowledge, we don't have any record of assaults occurring in our restrooms. That public denial was less than a month after the bathroom rape of Scott Smith's daughter. So as a matter of fact, of course, the superintendent's statement was not true. As the principal told the grand jury, another witness told the grand jury, the superintendent's statement was, quote, a bald-faced lie. Superintendent Ziegler tried to wiggle his way out of the lie by saying that he thought the question was about bathroom attacks where transgender or non-binary students were involved specifically. It has since been denied that the attacker had a transgender identity, so technically, he didn't lie because this attack involved no transgenderism relevant to the policy debate. That was Ziegler's defense. Except his statement didn't say that, nor did the question to which he was responding both referenced bathroom assaults in general, not transgender specific. Besides, it doesn't make sense to say we don't have any records of assault that happened as a result of a policy that we haven't implemented yet. And if we're supposed to believe that he's just absent-minded and he just forgot about such an event, well, the grand jury didn't buy that because the evidence doesn't support it. Records and testimony show that the superintendent was part of a meeting with the principal the afternoon of the original rape case. That same afternoon, the superintendent also sent out a group email to inform other school officials about the incident. This isn't an email he's just copied on and may have glanced at and forgotten about. This is an email he wrote to inform others about what happened, which he describes as, yes, a sexual assault in a bathroom. Add all that up, and the grand jury approved an indictment against Superintendent Scott Ziegler for the lie. Three charges, actually. The lie, plus other matters related to retaliation against a teacher's lawsuit, all misdemeanors. The school spokesman, Wade Byard, was indicted with a felony charge of perjury for lying under oath, believed to be lying to the grand jury itself about the matter. The perjury charge carries the prospect of serious penalty up to 10 years in prison, the three misdemeanor charges for the superintendent, obviously much less. Only a year of prison possible, though, of course, unlikely. And I should temper my appreciation for any accountability. One, because that accountability hasn't actually been realized yet. But two, because any punishment for the superintendent is likely to be insignificant compared to what is actually a reward. Reportedly, Ziegler will receive a $350,000 severance payout because he was fired without cause, even though the cause was clearly the release of the damning grand jury report last Tuesday, immediately after which the board fired him. But even if the punishment is difficult to appreciate fully because it's actually mostly a reward, I will still appreciate the accountability of the truth. No more lies, no more obfuscation, just the facts for all to see. That is still a comparative win. And what was the reason for the lie? That is the heart of this scandal. It wasn't just to save the public image of the school district from the embarrassment of the sort of attack that shouldn't ever happen. It wasn't to protect the integrity of the law enforcement investigation. This lie was purely for the promotion of an ideologically driven policy change, not by the parents, 
but despite them. The superintendent implicitly admits as much. Oh, I thought the question was only in the transgender context, which is why I concealed relevant facts, because I would never compromise the integrity of the transgender cause. The scandal isn't just that a young girl was raped, though of course that is plenty scandalous enough. The scandal is that rape was treated as collateral damage of secondary importance to the cause, indeed so distantly secondary that a second attack was enabled so long as the agenda could succeed. You'll see a lot of fact checks and pushback on the same idea that this entire story is even transgender relevant at all. Michelle Goldberg wrote in the New York Times that this was the right's big lie because the attacker in this case wasn't actually transgender and the inclusive bathroom policy at the time wasn't in place. And given the prior relationship between the attacker and Smith's daughter, this wasn't a case of a transgender student abusing a bathroom policy to target a victim as it was portrayed. Several similar pieces were published last year. Actually, there is no transgenderism in this story at all. The mother of the rapist says he doesn't even identify as female. First of all, Given the photographic evidence, I will speculate comfortably that gender identity is at least partially relevant in this case. But even if it isn't, the scandal here is not the gender identity of the rapist or the bathroom policy that was in place at the time of the rape. The scandal is covering up that rape in service to the promotion of new policy. If you think the initial right-wing investigation into the matter characterized the issue wrongly, try no characterization of the issue at all, because that's what you get without it. Not a flawed story, but no story. And parents in the dark about what's actually going on at their kids' schools. As though it's somehow worse to have many of the facts, with perhaps some slight inaccuracies, than it is to have no facts at all. Fundamentally, this was never a scandal about what the correct bathroom policy is. This is a scandal about who gets to make that decision. Parents? with the entirety of the relevant information to consider and to, by the way, elect the board members themselves or school administrators who think they know better and who think they're entitled to information control. And if you argue for the side of less information, you don't get to argue for information integrity simultaneously, because after all, the only reason you even have a story to scrutinize in the first place is precisely because someone else asked the questions that you refuse to. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Minds. That is at M L Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye.